Hello, sparkly beans. My name is Avery, and if you are new here, um, I help folks who are passionate about liberation and justice to find themselves and their roles in an emerging future. And one of the ways that I do that is through astrology. In this series, Practical Astrology 101, we take a look at um, various astrological concepts from a beginner's level and apply them um, in ways that are practical and useful and accessible. And in this video, we are continuing in our little foundational series um, where we are now talking about the planets. So we've covered, um, as a reminder, the signs. We had two videos about the signs, then we did the houses, and now we finally made it to the planets. So I, as I mentioned in the last few videos, um, my reasoning for this order is so that we can um, kind of build up the foundations of what the planet or point is like. So the kind of adjective, the sign, the quality, the flavor, and then where it shows up, that's the house. So what area of life um, the planet or point shows up in. And now we're kind of getting to the subject of the sentence. Um, technically the verb, but, <laughs> uh, and that's gonna be the planet itself. Now you'll notice that I say planet or point, or sometimes you'll hear people say placement. Um, and that vocabulary, that sort of like shifting vocabulary, is because in astrology, when we're talking about um, particular placements, or a placement just means something that is in a place on a chart, um, we might be talking about planets, but we also might be talking about a few other things. And the word planet doesn't mean exactly the same thing in astrology as it does in astronomy. So um, in this video, we're gonna start by just sort of covering like what is a planet and what are the other things, other kinds of placements or points that might show up. Um, and then we'll get into talking about each of what astrology would call the planets. Before we go any further, I just want to remind you that this uh, free content is made possible by folks who are um, supporting me through Patreon. So you can find a link below. Um, if you have received value from this content, if you find it useful, or if you just recognize the value that it might have for others, um, and you want to help me to be able to make um, long form in-depth content like this, tarot and astrology education, um, as well as uh, doing writing and, and other kinds of in-depth stuff, um, then I would love it if you recognize that value um, by giving a little bit below. Um, that is, of course, entirely optional. It, um, I invite you to give within your capacity what you can and um, according to the value that you receive. So there's uh, no particular uh, tiers. There's just different levels that you can contribute at, um, but I would love you to do so if you are able and if you would like. Um, I also would invite you to uh, share this channel with a friend, to subscribe, and also to check out my newsletter, link below. Um, that is the place where you're going to find out first about new stuff um, <laughs> of various kinds, new offerings that I have, as well as um, really getting some like long form in-depth content um, that you can't find anywhere else. So I would love for you to, um, to follow me there. It's sort of my primary channel. And of course, subscribe on YouTube. Okay, so let's jump into it. Um, so like I said, planets doesn't mean the exact same thing in astronomy and astrology. So when we say planets, in astrology, we're actually uh, including some things that you wouldn't in astronomy. So that includes Pluto, RIP Pluto. I still think Pluto's a planet. Don't care what you say, IAU or whatever it is. Um, if anyone's heard the Two Skinny Jays song, Pluto is a planet, leave a comment below. I'll be very shocked, but it's one of my anthems. Pluto is a planet. Uh, but yeah, Pluto's a planet for astrology. Also, um, the luminaries, the sun and the moon, they're called the luminaries in astrology, they're also planets, we just call them planets. It's, of course they're not planets, but it's fine. Um, and then Earth isn't a planet because everything in astrology is from the reference point of Earth. Um, so the planets in astrology would then be um, the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars. Um, my brain was like, what order do Saturn and Jupiter go in for a second? Venus, Mars, um, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. But like I said, uh, planets are not the only thing that we look at when we're looking at astrological placements. So I'm only going to cover planets in this video. Um, who knows? I may do other videos about some of the other things. Um, we already sort of touched on one of them, which is um, a few different chart points that we call the angles. We mentioned in the last video on the houses. So go ahead and check that out if you haven't seen it already. Um, we talked about the 
AC, IC, the DC, and the MC. Those four angles um, are points that can, just like a planet, take on the flavor of the sign that they're in. Um, and I didn't really go into that in depth. I talked about what each of those means, but um, when you're talking about the angles, um, it's it can be interesting because you might have, depending on the house system that you're using, um, there can be differences between how you think about house cusps and, and various things. Um, but you're always going to have the sort of flavor of the angle. So um, if you are a, uh, like me, a Cancer Rising, for example, or let's say you have your um, MC in Leo, right? Um, it's going to take on that flavor. So that's one kind of sort of point. Um, there are a lot of other points that are not actually bodies in the sky, but they're calculated points. So you might have heard of things um, maybe like, uh, well, the nodes is probably one of the most um, talked about ones. Um, I've actually done a video on this channel before I started this fundamental series. Um, I've done a video within Practical Astrology 101, so you can check the playlist um, about eclipses, um, where I do talk about the nodes of the moon, which are calculated points, but based on the, um, the path of the ecliptic. Um, there are other points like the vertex or um, trying to think of other things. You can calculate midpoints between things. There's all different ways of using various points um, in astrology. And then also, in addition to planets, there are other bodies in the sky um, that have astrological meaning. So there are dwarf planets, there are asteroids um, that we will sometimes talk about. Um, in my own practice, um, I'm interested in a lot of those, but in my own practice, I tend to mostly look at the planets, um, I look at the angles, I look at Chiron, um, I look at the nodes, and I tend to look at a few of the asteroids that are most commonly referenced, um, or I guess maybe the earliest ones that were um, worked with, uh, kind of known as the asteroid goddesses. Um, but there are many more things you can work, uh, work with. Some folks also work with um, what are called fixed stars, um, but fixed stars are fixed. Um, basically. Um, and so uh, those are those are just the same as like a specific point in the wheel, um, a specific like 12 degrees cancer or what have you um, would be the location. From our perspective, it pretty much looks fixed, right? It's the stars that make up the constellations, make up the zodiac. Um, but those can also be used. Um, so that's sort of a rundown of like some of the other kinds of things you might encounter, but right now we're just going to talk about planets. All right, so let's get into it. Planets. Um, what are they? How are we using them? So just as a reminder, um, like other things we've talked about, you can have your natal placements. Um, so where's the planet in your natal chart? And then you're also going to have um, transits. So you're going to have, for example, Saturn is transiting a sign. Saturn is moving through that sign in the sky right now. Um, and you'll... There are also other kinds of concepts around planets. So one of them, for example, is um, that you may have heard of. Um, well, I'll give you two, actually, that you may have heard of. Um, and we'll probably do videos on these concepts um, specifically. So one is the idea of like a planetary phase. And this is, um, you may have heard of Saturn return, right? So this is the cycle of... Um, well, no, I'm sorry. Planetary phase is probably the wrong word for that. That's a, that's a different thing. But... Um, the cycle of where, particularly, we tend to look at this with, with outer planets, um, well, some of the outer planets, um, specifically, you look at Jupiter, you look at Saturn, um, you look at, sometimes I think folks will look at, like, it's a Venus return or Mars return, but it's really Jupiter and Saturn that you tend to look at things like, um, as well as, I guess, Uranus as well, yeah. Um, you would look at things like the Saturn square, like the opening square, and then you look at the opposition, and then the closing square, and then the return. So that's, it's almost like, if you're familiar with moon phases, um, you know, new moon, for, first quarter, full moon, third quarter, new moon again, same concept with planets. Um, so that is one thing we're not gonna get into in this video, but we might do in a, in a future video. Um, there, um, there's also retrogrades, um, and I think we're, I am planning to do a video about planetary motion. So we will talk about retrogrades and like the speeds of planets. 
For right now though, I just wanna give you kind of what each planet um, tends to signify in a chart um, so that you can match it up with what would it look like if that planet goes with this sign in this house. And we'll give an example or two for each. Um, I also want to note, and again, I'll probably do a separate video on this at some point. There are various schemes for thinking about the planets um, in terms of, uh, so like, especially with Hellenistic astrology, if you're interested in Hellenistic astrology, which is one of the more ancient traditions, um, you're going to see things like planets are associated with qualities like hot and dry or wet or cold and um, there are planets that are associated with sect like day or night um, which sect they belong to or is it a day planet or a night planet the um, gender shows up um, and of course as a non-binary person I mostly throw that out the window um, but planets are associated with, with feminine and masculine qualities and there's some really interesting ways in which people are querying that um, in, uh, in Hellenistic astrology um, there's also, you might come across things like, um, there's a whole scheme that's known as dignity, um, essential, essential dignity specifically, um, essential dignity. So you might hear things like this planet rules this sign, or this planet is in domicile, this planet is exalted, this planet is in detriment or in fall. And this kind of refers to like how comfortable a planet is considered in various signs, according to this traditional rulership scheme. Um, then um let's see what else uh, so there's yeah there's dignity um you might also see there there are what are called planetary joys so that's about the houses like is a planet particularly happy in a particular house um there's that scheme uh, and then there's just you might hear the the phrase malefic or benefic um, which just refers to like a general quality of the planet um and how strong that is depends on the sect of day or night. All of that exists and we're not going to cover it right now. In fact, we may lump some of that together in a, in a future video. Let me know like which of these um, topics you're curious and learning more about. But for now, let's go ahead and just get started with like, the basic meanings. Okay, so where should we start? Let's start with the sun. We tend to like to start with the sun. Um, sun sign astrology is probably the first kind of astrology you ever heard of. Certainly is for me, right? Your magazine horoscope. Um, when somebody asks what, what's your sign, they usually mean your sun sign. So what is a sign? Um, well, the nice thing about, honestly, about some of the planets is that you can kind of get an idea of their meaning, um, in some cases, based on qualities that they have, um, right? Their, their, their speed, their size, things like that. Um, so with the sun, right, it's light, <laughs> yeah? So it's, it's visibility. Um, and so the sun in the chart is going to represent um, a core identity for the individual. A, um, you know, their their kind of purpose. They're often like kind of I don't want to say public purpose, but like it's a very core sort of um, the the individual's vitality is spoken about with the sun. So that makes sense, right? Think about light. Light is energy. Um, so their vitality, their um, their identity, some. Folks, um, I've noticed we'll talk about how it's common to not really relate to your sun sign as much until you're around age 30. You kind of grow into your sun sign. Um, I found that really helpful personally because um, if you ever have been like, I don't relate to my sign, right? It might be because you're still like growing into it or you, or you, ha you know, you spend a lot, a lot of your life like not fully grown into it. That's like one take on the sun. I think other people would just say, it's a self, it's the like most core self, um, is one way to think about it. I like to think about purpose of the, in the sense of sort of like, um, like what you're generally here to do. There, there are other points in planets that will refer to purpose. Um, you know, you can look at, we, we mentioned, we talked about the um, MC as like the impact that you have on the world. Like that's kind of, you know, that is a kind of purpose. You could think of the North Node as a kind of purpose. But the sun, I think, is like, has this fundamental sense of like, that's you, you know? Um, and so, and depending on whether your sun sign and your moon sign and your rising sign, like depending on how those are known as the big three, um, if they're very different signs or very similar signs, 
that can really affect the way you experience them. So we talked about how the rising sign, the AC, in the houses video, we talked about how that sort of like first impression, the way people kind of like, the first thing they, they get when they see you, somebody doesn't know you very well, then they might think of you as your rising sign. Um, and then maybe if they get to know you more, especially if you are an adult and you're past the age of 30, um, then they might start to see you more as your sun sign. Um, or it may be that, you know, your kind of core purpose is your sun, but like the way you present, the like mask you put on the, the um, persona that you present is more your rising sign. Um, if those are very similar signs, there might not be as much of an obvious difference. Um, and then we're, we'll get into your moon sign as well. So like an example of a sun sign, um, it's probably the, the most, I guess, like vanilla, <laughs> quote unquote. Um, but uh, let's say, you know, somebody who has their um, sun in Virgo, like they might really be here to, um, to improve, to optimize, to make people's lives better, to serve um, others through, um, you know, optimizing their material experience, um, some, some traits of Virgo. Um, and then you add on a house placement. So let's say um, it's sun in Virgo in the, I don't know, sixth house. Or let's do, let's actually do, because some people like, associate six with Virgo. If you're doing that 12 letter alphabet, which I know we've talked about, is not everybody's favorite thing. Um, but let's say it's sun in Virgo in the 11th. So let's say that your sun is in the 11th house and for you, it's in Virgo. Um, so, and keep in mind, by the way, that depending on the house system you use, you know, we talked about how some house systems, the house cusp or the, the sign that's associated with the beginning of the house may not be the same sign that every planet is in that house. So you could have your 11th house cusp occur um, in Leo, but then your sun is in Virgo, depending on the system you use. Um, and so that can be like kind of interesting because, you know, um, well, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, mix and match. It's kind of interesting to look at. Um, but as I said in the last video, we're going to mostly just assume we're using whole signs houses for this, so it's going to be the same. Um, so again, our example of Sun and Virgo in the 11th. Okay, so so we've got an idea of this individual, you know, their identity, their purpose might be really involved in service. Virgo, you know, details um, like improving and optimizing um, in service of somebody and, and really in the material world. Now we're looking at doing that in the area of the 11th house. Now we're talking about... Um, you know, your hopes, your dreams, and the communities and organizations and groups that form around that. Um, so a son in Virgo in the 11th might be someone who, um, like, really identifies with making things as good as they can be, and then um, they tend to carry that out uh, around, like, activism or organizing. So they might be the person who's really good at, like, making sure we've got the strategy <laughs> Um, for our campaign and making sure that um, that we have all the tangible things we need and that we're, we're um, like maximizing our resources. That would be an example. Um, okay, so let's move on to the moon sign. The moon, another luminary. So the moon, it's also light, but it's reflective light, right? It's reflecting the sun's light. Um, and the moon is... Um, you know, when we look at we look at your moon, we tend to not just look at the sign and house, but for the moon, um, we'll often be looking at its phase. Um, and I don't think we've done a video yet on moon phases. If not, we will. But um, keep in mind, your lunar phase is often something you, you might look at as well, right? Were you born under a full moon, a new moon? Um, we won't go into that right now, but just kind of have that in the back of your mind. So the moon is going to represent um, our emotions, our subconscious. It's going to represent our, our pri or a part of our private self, really. And then the moon is kind of like also um, associated with day to day and like your, you know, kind of what you default to. Um, I should note, by the way, that as I'm sharing these different meanings for the planets, some of, some of the meanings are like a little more traditional, a little more modern. Um, and I'm just kind of throwing them all in there. Um, and so depending on the astrologer, they might emphasize parts of this a little more. But um, the moon sign is like, it's very much a, like a, com a comfort zone, but also like um, maybe less comfort zone and more like, where do you retreat to when you're stressed? Like when you're emotional, when you're, when you're in your feelings, when you're 
when things are hard, like what do you tend towards, you know? Um, other people aren't necessarily going to see your moon sign. Um, for me, I happen to have the same moon and rising. In fact, they're conjunct. They're very close to one another. So for me, it's like what you're going to actually see, like I wear, and it's cancer. So I wear my emotions on my sleeve, right? Like you're going to be able to see what's going on for me internally, um, which is totally true to my life experience, right? I, I absolutely like, sometimes I can overshare, um, but you know, I will, first impression, I will be like, let me tell you about my emotional life. Um, that is not true for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, um, for example, like, let's say somebody has the, the opposite rising to me. Let's say they're Capricorn rising with moon and cancer. Well, that person is probably going to have like a very deep emotional life they're, um, you know, they, they're going to need the kind of like comfort and safety that comes with cancer. Like a cancer moon really needs to have like a place they can retreat, a safe place, um, a, a home, um, you know, might be very like nurturing with their close people one-on-one. -on -one. There's the ding to let us know that it's a, it's a good thought. Um, you know, might be really nurturing and caring and need care, um, you know, individually with the people that they allow into their little crab shell. Um, so that's the like Cancer Moon piece. But then if they, if they have a Capricorn rising, it might be that they're seen by people who don't know them well, or seen as kind of, as the workhorse, as the, the disciplined person, as the, um, you know, uh, like the person who kind of gets shit done and builds things and like Capricorn traits. Um, and, they, and, and may seem actually outwardly not particularly emotional, but then they have a very deep emotional life and maybe a sensitivity underneath that other people don't see. Because in that case, you have the, the moon and the rising opposed, they're gonna kind of go back and forth against each other. So, so hopefully that helps you see how the kind of the big three can work together. Um, and then, you know, where your moon is um, it also speaks to those same themes. Um, so, you know, it, it, typically the, the house where the moon is, like, that might be a place of comfort, a place of, um, like, if no one else gets to decide what you're doing, then, like, you might sort of default to that, that space. Because um, it's that private self. So... Sun and the moon, really important. Rising also, which we already mentioned because it's not a planet, but those three are really important. So let's move on to some of the personal planets. Um, so we, we call them the personal planets, um, Mercury, Mars, Venus. Um, we call the um, sun, I, I think it depends on the tradition you come from. Some people call Jupiter and Saturn the social planets. Some people just call them outer planets. Um, I think if you're a modern astrologer, you might be more likely to call them the social planets because then you have Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. You know, a, a Hellenistic astrologer wouldn't work with those outer planets, the uh, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, because they weren't discovered at the time that Hellenistic astrology was a thing. Um, but there are many people who use Hellenistic techniques and just bring in the, the outer planets as well. It just depends on the person. Um, but the personal planets um you also you know they similarly to how we talked about um the signs having qualities of um there being like personal social or maybe a, maybe interpersonal interpersonal social kind of mix those up and transpersonal same is true of um the planets so the personal planets tend to be personal they tend to be very self-oriented um, about the kind of fundamentals of the self and then you get to the um jupiter and saturn now you're dealing a little more with like um collective themes or um especially like interpersonal social themes um and and, and kind of the external like what what you know what limits you and what expands you and we'll get into that and then when you go out another layer and you're talking about the outer planets well now you're talking about these very slow moving planets where their signatures are generational you know where um so many, you know, a number of years of, um, of babies born in a span are going to have the same placement. Um, and so now we're starting to look with the, the outer planets, um, more towards sort of transpersonal, like universal or collect bigger collective energies. Um, but the personal planets, we're going to start there. So the personal planets, like the sun and the moon, have relatively short cycles, and so we, we tend to work with their energies um, in transit a lot in our personal charts, um, because, of course, as we know, the sun 
you know, 365 days. So, um, you know, you have the, those fixed periods of, you know, this is Pisces season or this is Aries season, um, certain number of dates. And then with the moon, you um, are going to move through signs very quickly, about two and a half days um, per sign. Um, and Mercury and Venus both travel very close to the sun. Now, their, their orbits don't totally match, and you've got direct and retrograde. We'll talk about planetary motion in another video. Um, but, you know, it's worth noting that you're going to tend to have your sun, your Mercury, and Venus are going to be close. Not necessarily, they can all be in the same sign. You can have, like, one over here and two in the same sign. They can be across three. It kind of depends. Um, but they're going to be relatively close to one another. Um, and then Mars moves uh, a little slower, um, and so that you hit your Mars return about every two years. Um, so it takes about a year to go around half the chart. Um, but again, planetary motion is a complicated topic. We're not going to get into it. Uh, but let's just jump into Mercury. So Mercury is one of my favorite um, planets to work with because I think it gives you, like, as somebody who enjoys teaching and speaking and writing, it, it deals with those kinds of topics and it gives you a lot of interesting information about how people communicate, how they process information, how you, um, so, so how you communicate, how you receive, so communication both ways, right? How you communicate out and how you receive in, how you receive information, how you process information, how you work with information. Um, and, and keep in mind that communication is not just verbal or even words. Um, there's all sorts of ways that we can communicate and there's all sorts of information. Um, and so your Mercury sign is gonna tell you about these themes. Uh, so when we look at somebody's, um, somebody's Mercury, let's give an example of, um, let's do like Mercury in, I don't know, how about Scorpio? Let's do Mercury in Scorpio. And let's say somebody has Mercury in Scorpio in the um, second house. I'm just going random here. Um, so Mercury and Scorpio in the second house. So what would happen if we put those together? Well, um, that would tell us that the way they tend to like to communicate, remember Scorpio really likes to go deep. Scorpio is investigative. Scorpio is not afraid to like dig down into the muck. So somebody with Mercury, Mercury and Scorpio is probably going to tend to want to have, you know, intense conversations. Like they're probably not a big fan of small talk. Um, it's a water sign, so they might enjoy, you know, getting into the emotions, getting into the, the sort of watery depths, um, uh, talking about, like, psychological stuff, talking about maybe taboo topics with Scorpio um, could be a thing. Um, when they, you know, when they take in and process information, like, they, it is a fixed sign, so they may, like, need some time with it. They may tend to, tend to, to kind of dwell on things, um, and not be like the most efficient processor necessarily. They, they might be somebody though who really loves research. Um, that's a very like Mercury and Scorpio thing is to like dig and investigate and, and research. Um, and if it's in the second house, okay, so maybe then you wanna go really deep into, um, into values, right? That's a theme of the second house, values, resources. Um, you know, might be really interested, might be interested in finances and economics. Um, you know, I could even see like a Mercury in Scorpio um, in the second, potentially. I mean, it is a water sign, so it is a little like more emotional and like analytical, but I could see like getting really interested in like, um, uh, like, what's the word? Like, I'm thinking of like stock market, but like, but um, not stock, but that's more eighth house, but second house, like personal finances, like maybe getting really into like the, the roots of um, like, where'd your money story come from, right? That feels very Mercury and Scorpio in the second to me, um, as an example. With Mercury, um, and we're not, you know, obviously not talking about every single placement. And if you are interested in a chart reading and want to dig more in, um, I do have a link below. You can do um, live sessions. Uh, I don't have one that's specifically labeled as astrology, but if you book a Neptune session with me, we can do all astrology if you want, or we can incorporate other modes. Um, that would be the best way to do astrology with me. Um, so we could go in more depth, and of course there are many um, other astrologers you can work with, but um, just thinking a little more broadly, when, um, when we think about planets, sometimes thinking not just by the like, specifics, um, specific sign, but by the element can be interesting. Um, and so you can think kind of like more generally, like, yeah, a water moon is probably going to be pretty emotional. Um, you know, a fire moon might be like, tend to be more on the like passionate and angry and, and like 
heat side right deep inside um when we look at mercury you know you can do similar things like a a water mercury um might be a little less depending on which sign but might be a little less um like tendency towards verbal processing or being really like analytical and a little more into the uh, like artistic or liminal or emotional communication so like mercury and pisces which i have um tends to be very like I can't explain to you what I mean, but I would be happy, happy to psychically transmit it to you. <laughs> I would be happy to write you a poem, right? Um, it's a very Mercury and Pisces thing, is to be like, my words may not make sense, but they're beautiful. Um, so that, you know, you can just kind of like feel into the sense by element. Okay, then we move from Mercury into Venus. So your Venus sign. Now, this is an area where I have opinions. Um, especially as somebody who's on the asexual spectrum, as somebody who is queer and who um, enjoys, uh, has been for a long time a relationship educator and, um, and talking about different ways of thinking about relationships, romance, sex, family. Um, I tend to get frustrated when Venus sign is like, oh, let's talk about love. And then Mars is let's talk about sex. Like, okay, yeah, but also, um, those are signifiers of those two planets. We'll get into Mars in a second, but, the way I like to think about Venus is that Venus is the way that you draw things in, the way you attract things to you, the way you, um, uh, it's, it's like a magnetic principle. Like how do you magnetize things to you? Um, and so, yeah, like people and, and, you know, it could be romantic partners. It also, Venus also has associations with like beauty and the arts and like, I, you know, what makes something beautiful to you? What, um, what do to do, do like your aesthetic sensibilities could fall your style can fall under venus um if you want to get kind of you know like fun certain <laughs> a little more surface level um but also yeah like the way you value things um so you know if you think about this like magnetism principle and how you draw things in and um and venus um let's say you have venus i don't know uh, what have we not done yet? Um, Venus in Gemini in the fifth. Again, I'm just pulling things out of my head. So Venus in Gemini in the fifth. So um, what would be the qualities of Venus in Gemini? Like how would they bring people or things or experiences in towards them? How would they magnetize? Well, Gemini... Is, is very sort of like all over the place, wants to grab from lots of different places. It's an air sign. Uh, it's very social and communicative. So I would expect that a, a Venus in Gemini, um, depending on other things in their chart, might tell you how much they really want to be at the party, but assuming they want to be at the party, um, that being in, in environments that are really social, that are really fun, that are, that are um, a lot of like witty people sharing ideas, that's going to really like turn that Venus on and want to bring people in or bring experiences in so they might you know you can talk about romance like you might meet a partner um through you know venus and gemini might really like fall in love through um all like interesting perspectives that, that somebody offers um but of course not everybody experiences romantic love not everyone experiences romantic attraction um so it could also just be you know in general like how do you draw things towards you like what are your sensibilities I mean, then we said, what, fifth house. So, um, yeah, I would tend to experience, like, I would think uh, any fifth house Venus, um, I mentioned that Venus is associated with, like, aesthetics and the arts. Okay, well, the fifth house um, includes things like creativity and, and arts and hobbies. And so you can really see any fifth house Venus um, being attracted to, to bring people in through the arts. But if it's specifically Gemini, that might affect what arts it is and what, um, kinds of like arenas um, so maybe maybe it's um, like what's a good example <laughs> my first thing that came to mind was actually web comics randomly because I was thinking you know like like Gemini can be really like social media um, uh, like lots of different opinions and I was just thinking like oh that's kind of a neat signification <laughs> like you know um, might like enjoy web comics or or meeting people through web comics or um, or like um, like fashion, like different fashions, um, maybe even like could be somebody who um, like is drawn to 
um, drawn to people who have like very different styles um, or drawn to a lot of different styles maybe would be a better better thought um, so that's Venus um, and I you know it is I, I don't want to completely dismiss the re relationships piece like um, I, I also think there's some really interesting things around relationships and I don't use any one chart signifier for like a sexual orientation or a relationship style um, but sometimes you will find interesting things once you know how somebody relates you can look at their venus sign so for example i have a venus in aries um and i have a venus in aries in the 10th and so for me the way that shows up for me um and there's other stuff in my chart that points to this but one of the ways that that shows up is that i tend to be really um uh like have a lot of nre or new relationship energy so if Aries is that like impulsive like starting energy, it's like I get I can like grab like relationships at the start or like it's you know it's Aries it's fire it's go it's it's exciting it's new you know and um, and then like whether that maintains or not is a different question um, and because it's in my tenth house like a lot of times you know yeah I'll meet people through like public arenas through through um, not necessarily work but like um, people who who have a similar calling or vocation or, or interest there um that definitely res resonates for me um so it's possible that you know your venus sign could point a little bit towards relationship style maybe but not necessarily um and i always like to look for multiple things in a chart as well um not just one so uh anyway we're gonna move now to your mars um so your mars sign is really i also really love more i really love mercury and mars um, because if Mercury is communication, how we communicate, Mars is how we act and how we do. And it's our energy, um, it's, um, it's drive, it's passion. Um, so it, it, sex is, is one sign, uh, signifier of Mars. Um, and yeah, it tells us a lot about like our energy and how we do things. So example, let's say you have Mars and Taurus um, in the 7th. Okay, so Mars and Taurus, um, you're gonna have the way you do things, the way your drive works, the way you act, right? It's gonna probably tend to be that once you get moving, you you kind of have a lot of inertia. So you're gonna have a lot of staying power and consistency in your energy. Um, but it might be a little slower, or it might be a little slower to start, like get into it. And like once you're in the grooves, like you're kind of in the grooves. Um, I think Mars and Taurus, because it, Taurus like significations around around quality and and um, yeah quality like value. I I can see like a Mars and Taurus being somebody who like has to really buy into what they're doing and like wants to be doing something that matters. Um, and then if it's in the seventh house, and again like the planets. It's not that you only communicate in the house where your Mercury is. It's not that you only have like meet people where your Venus is. It's not that you only have energy or drive where your Mars is. Um, but that's an area where that thing might show up, especially. So, and particularly the, the flavor and the quality. So your Mars and Taurus nature might really come out, seventh house, one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, so it might be that like, um, you know, if you were talking about romance and sex, right, it might be that, like, a Mars and Taurus in the seventh um, really wants to, like, probably, you know, get something out of having a consistency in their, um, in their relationships, in their, in their sexual relationships, if they have any, um, like, having a consistency and a familiarity and a, and a reliability dependability and, and, and equality right like like could be picky um you know wants to have like good sex um but it would tend to be like very loyal and, and probably stick around depending on what the relationship style is because i do really hate it when um astrologers especially astrology books tend to do this where it's like you know if your if your venus is in gemini or mars is in gemini like you're always going to be cheating like no um, you have to put it within the context of the, of the relationship style and, and a lot of other things, the rest of the chart. So, um, but yeah, so, and then outside of, of the 
sexual significations. It might just be that in one-on-one relationships, this Mars and Taurus in the seventh, um, that's a place, one-on-one relationships is a place where they really um, do tend to have like a staying power of their energy. Um, and and might be a little slow to get into the, into relationships with people and to like have that connection. But once they have it, it's sort of there for life or there for a long time. So that's Mars. I think Mars can also be from a disability perspective. And I, I'm going to do at some point a whole video, probably multiple videos about disability and some of the planets. Um, so you're, I should have actually started well we'll just backtrack and i'll say that the personal planets can be really illuminating and interesting around um topics of disability health um not not to say that again there's no one signifier of anything in the chart but once you know your experience you can sometimes find things in the chart that point to that um so you know sometimes if you're neurodivergent it might be that your mercury is in a place that is traditionally thought of as uncomfortable or different um it might be that, you know, your, um, if you suffer from anxiety, depression, your moon sign might tell you a little bit about that. Um, if you, um, with energy, right? Like if you have issues around fatigue or, or things that are related to, um, your energy or your drive and your vitality, um, whether it be fatigue or it could be, um, an excess, right, of energy, your Mars sign might tell you something about that. Um, there's a whole discipline of medical astrology too that gets into this but um and i would strongly recommend if you're curious uh, claire gallagher's book body astrology phenomenal um, and really accessible on that okay so mercury venus mars so those you can kind of see how those are some really like personal um significations um when we're thinking about how we communicate how we draw people in what we value how we um how we act how our drive right Okay, so now we get into Jupiter and Saturn. So these, we start to get really, like Jupiter and Saturn, Mars and Venus are like this too. Um, but I think especially with Jupiter and Saturn, you know, it, it can be kind of over-reduced to like Jupiter good, Saturn bad. Um, and it's, that's not, that's not how that works. Um, so Jupiter does, can bring, for sure, um, abundance, can bring luck and blessings and fortune, stuff like that. But I like to think of Jupiter more as like an expansion principle, as an increase principle, as a getting bigger. You know, Jupiter is a huge ass planet, right? So it's, it expands, it makes larger. It, um, it can definitely be a part of an area of life by house where you, we tend to maybe experience um, some fortune or since you experience some things might be a little naturally easier for you, but not necessarily. And especially again, looking at other things in the chart aspects to Jupiter, we'll cover aspects in a later video. Um, you know, sometimes it's more that you're meant to learn and grow and expand through that, but you may not actually find that area easy. Um, a good example of this would be, you know, by transit, a lot of times it's like, Oh, Jupiter's in this house. You know, I'm gonna have a lot of luck in that house. Well, will you, um, Maybe, maybe not, because it can also just be increasing what's in that area for you. Um, and depending on some of your natal placements, that, that might come across in different ways. Um, but generally speaking, you can think of abundance, expansion, bigger. <laughs> um, so if you have um, Jupiter in, um, what have we done so far? Jupiter in, I'm like going through the signs, what we've already covered. Um, Let's do, we did Capricorn, we did Capricorn, Aquarius, let's do Jupiter and Aquarius, let's say Jupiter and Aquarius in the, how's this, how's this, fourth, Jupiter and Aquarius the fourth, okay, great, so now we know that this person is going to tend to expand, going to tend to um, grow, to learn, to, you know, get bigger through, um, in an Aquarius kind of a way. And so this might be, um, oh, that's hilarious. I have Jupiter Aquarius. I didn't even think about that. I have Jupiter Aquarius. <laughs> I could talk about this. Um, so, and this has been true for me, right? Um, Aquarius has a very like humanitarian vibe to it. It also has a, an outsider vibe. So, um, you know, it can be kind of ahead of the curve. So if you have Jupiter and Aquarius, you can, 
you can really like expand through and grow through a focus on the collective or on humanity as a whole and how to improve things for humanity but you might be a little ahead of what's accepted or normal or natural um so like having kind of what are considered radical viewpoints um around things like race and gender and, and disability etc um you know that's not always like been accepted and it's not always um that's an area in which i as a jupiter and aquarius person um like point myself towards and have realized once i got over the like fears of youth of like for example being a queer kid raised you know in the south in the 80s 90s like i was not expanding through like leaning into that as a kid but then i've grown into that so so again like that can be the like growing into it um and then we said what house did we say um fourth fourth house so the fourth house um you know home foundations roots ancestry um so maybe somebody who has jupiter and aquarius in the fourth um could be really drawn to like an unusual way of looking at ancestry and oh maybe land maybe like um like land back movements and like um uh like maybe really ahead of the curve on um on native sovereignty or on um like um maybe like some of the folks who who started who were like early in the whole kind of ancestral healing bringing ancestral healing to more folks might have had a jupiter aquarius in the fourth as an example um or might just in a more private sphere right the fourth house being at the bottom of the chart the kind of most private area you know it might be that like this person is going to really expand through being able to be different in their family like the black sheep or the outsider maybe um would be a possibility there um or you could get more literal you know Aquarius technology could be like uh um like <laughs> like somebody who like did something around I don't know like private home networks or something like I mean, sometimes it could be really like random and, and literal uh okay so then Saturn Saturn is um you know Saturn so Saturn gets an interesting reputation so Saturn does definitely set limits, boundaries. Um, Saturn, Saturn is good at saying no. Saturn can be an area of challenge, an obstacle, sort of the opposite of Jupiter. Um, Saturn can be, uh, well, Saturn can be any of those things. And also Saturn represents some other principles like, um, like time, both past and future. One of the cool things I heard in a lecture once, I can't remember who, although I will say that Diana Rose Harper does some really amazing work on Saturn specifically. Um, but I remember hearing, I've heard this a couple times, I guess, that Saturn in the Hellenistic system, it was the last planet that they knew about. And so it has this role as like, the, some of the stuff around limits and boundaries, it's really like a gatekeeper role, but not in like a shitty gatekeeper role, more in the sense of like, once you get past Saturn, you're now going into like the spiritual otherworldly realm of what is beyond knowledge. And so Saturn has associations with, with knowledge, but also just like this kind of, you have to be ready. You have to do the quest to get, to be ready to continue. So Saturn, I think, kind of protects the other, the otherworldly realms that protects the line between observable reality and what's beyond it. Um, and I think that's a really cool, like, you know, way to look at Saturn. Um, and so Saturn in your chart might point to, might be an area where you have felt restriction, constriction, where you, um, where you feel, um, kind of blocked or like you can get shut down or kind of told what to do. Um, it might be, yeah, just the general area of challenge. Um, it might be though also where you, um, yeah, you know, there can be like structure in this area as well and like a tendency towards container like building containers in this area um of the chart so like let's say you have your saturn we haven't done the third yet let's say you have saturn third and let's give it um libra so let's say you have a libra a saturn third okay so um so the way 
limitation, restriction, constraint shows up for you. Um, when we think about Libra, that's an interesting, I haven't really thought about Saturn and Libra that much. Um, so we're doing this live, folks, I'm doing this on the fly. Um, I mean, all of it's on the fly, but that one, I'm like, huh, what is Saturn and Libra? Um, mainly because, so Saturn is another one that's kind of, um, like generational. Um, I mean, it's a shorter, it's shorter generational. So somebody, um, I think Dion, was it Dion? No, it was Kira. It was Kira, um, over at, uh, Wow, Kira's channel is the, the astrology, the, the astrology show, and then um, Kira also runs the Eleventh House, a really cool um, astrology learning community. Uh, Kira did some work uh, a little while ago that you could probably look up um, around generations, and and one of the things is that your Saturn generation is typically going to be because of the duration, going to be the people that you went to high school with, but I mean this is a U.S. kind of model, but. Um, your high school cohort and then your Jupiter cohort would be um, tend to be the people that were like right around in your grade or, or thereabouts like give or take um, and again like planetary motion is kind of futzy sometimes like we just had Jupiter for example transit through Pisces very quickly um, so that's going to be a shorter group of people um, but more or less um, that that's how it's going to tend to go and so um so I'm like a lot of people I know are going to be in similar um, Saturn generations to me. So I'm Saturn and Scorpio, but I know a lot of Saturn and Libra. So I'm thinking about Saturn and Libra. It's like, what is it about them? Um, but I think you know, if you think about restriction and how you how you set boundaries and structure, and then you think about Libra. So Libra is all about the other and and all about in particular like um, oh, what am I trying to say? Um, Ken wants to to understand like all the different opinions and then find sort of the balance or find the harmony between them um and so you can imagine that um kind of potentially like making const if you're saturn libra like potentially making constriction or um or making rules around like what does the collective think or what is the like average or the like thing that would bring us to like harmonious like what is a harmonious structure um and then in the third I said third um so might be doing that but focused on the local environment and that sort of level of of detail and so looking at um you know a saturn in libra in the third if they have a lot of siblings might kind of tend to be like the peacemaker but like in a kind of like um I just immediately was thinking, like, uh, none of us can go, like, like, the oldest sibling might technically be old enough to, you know, do X, but none of us should get to until we're all that age, like, right? that's, that feels like a Saturn and Libra in the third, um, example. So, I, I find, sometimes I find Saturn easier to relate to, at least personally, I don't know if this is true for others, but, um, personally around the house placement of just like where I feel restrictions. So like a Saturn in the third house might feel, tend to feel limitation and restriction and challenge around their siblings, their close friends, their, um, their like local community or environment. Um, whereas like I have it in the fifth, um, I tend to have restriction or I like feel like I'm, I'm not creative or, or feel like, um, like have trouble thinking expansively about creativity like that's a fifth house thing um as opposed to the sign but you know your mileage may vary on that okay so now the outer planets we're gonna go through a little quicker um like i said they're not you know since we're talking mostly about natal astrology here like they're a little less um they, they get interesting when you talk about mundane astrology and like the the cycles of countries or the cycles of um you know, where we're all collectively kind of focused. So we'll start with Uranus. Um, so I think I'll actually give like some examples maybe um, more collectively, although I'll like note about the chart. Um, so Uranus uh, is the planet of like disruption, um, sudden, sudden sort of shocking thing, like 
uh, inventions, uh, innovation would be the better word than inventions, innovations, um, things that really like jump the needle ahead a lot more than you're expecting. Um, uh, or it could be like crisis and catastrophe as well, but things that are really like shocking and sudden. Um, in a personal chart, often it's like the area in which you're kind of an, more of an outsider or rebellious or do things differently. Um, there's also that bent to it. It has a very queer energy, I think. I think all the outer planets have queer, I think all the planets have queer energy, but Uranus especially. Um, and so um, you, you might look at your personal chart and find that the area where it is resonates there for you. So like I have Uranus in the sixth and I definitely feel like um, I am outside the north, like being able to innovate and change and, and be really rebellious about daily routine um, and about productivity. You may have seen the Unproductive series on this channel. I'm um, bringing that back. I'm actually I'm doing a lot of work around this, like healing from productivity wounds and um, like challenging, you know, thinking around like labor and, and productivity and, and work and routine and all of that is very like Uranus in the six. Like, let's be different in that area. But if we look collectively, I think when we look by sign, it, it can be help, more helpful um, because so many people have the same Uranus sign. It can be helpful to look uh, at sort of a collective mood as it were. Um, so right now Uranus has, is in and has been in uh, Taurus. Um, and so Uranus and Taurus, well now we're looking at, um, you know, uh, Taurus being like very, it's earthy, it's grounded, it's, um, it's resources. So we've got things like, um, you know, um, agriculture and like a lot of people have talked about with Uranus and Taurus, like um, plant-based meat. Um, so like food, you know, like literally resource, like the things we used to feed ourselves in the Taurus and then um, innovation in that. Um, talking about things like cryptocurrency, um, you know, ugh, um, <laughs> cryptocurrency, but like a different way of thinking about finances um, and, and kind of shocks to that, um, financial shocks, um, et cetera. So Uranus, Neptune, so you got Uranus is like the shock, shock, shock. Neptune then is like the, mm, so Neptune is very like, dissolves boundaries, it's liminal, it's fluid, it's, um, Neptune, I, I find Neptune really, I work with Neptune a lot, and I find it really interesting because Neptune both represents some things that sound really good and some things that sound really bad, so, <laughs> which, it's not that kind of dry, but, so it represents things like our spiritual impulses, especially, um, so, like, Jupiter might be more, like, thinking about um, like philosophy and ideology, but then Neptune is gonna be more like the, the universal impulse, the like spiritual, like you could say spiritual, not religious, but, um, but very much like where we are all one, where, how we are all sort of part of the same stuff. Um, Neptune, uh, can be very like dreamy in a good way, right? It can be like the spiritual, the dreamy, but it can also be the dreamy in terms of you're just confused. Delusion, addiction comes up sometimes in personal charts with Neptune. Um, and yeah, just like, ooh, like when there's not a whole lot of structure and boundaries, you know, things can get weird. Um, so Neptune um, has been transiting Pisces and that's sort of Neptune on top of Neptune. And so it's very much that feeling of like, um, with Neptune and Pisces, you've got a lot of that. And then, um, you know, you've also now got Jupiter there. So Jupiter's like expanding the already Pisces Neptune. So it's like a flood, it's like water. Um, and so in whatever area of your chart you have Pisces, you might have just been real confused lately or just feeling like, wow, like, or maybe, you know, you're breaking down barriers and you're thinking about things in new and creative ways. Like it can kind of go a number of different ways. Um, but that would, that would be Neptune. Um, and so you may find in the house where you have Neptune natally that you tend to have some confusion or, you know, some breakdown, some difficulty maybe communicating or, um, or like understanding that area. It might be also though that you do have like visions and dreams and um that you're imaginative in that area um like whatever that may be for you um so let's say we haven't talked about the first house let's say you have neptune in the first any planet by the way in the first is going to be like a strong part of your personality if you have neptune in the first you're probably a really artistic person you're probably a really imaginative creative person 
Um, we may also have like some sort of like confusion about the self and like who am I and and you know not being like really into labels and identities and tending to kind of be fluid in in like who you are. Um, you, you may even not, like not have a very strong sense of self because you really feel so connected to everything around you. Um, like maybe, you, you know, there could be some psychic stuff going on there where like the boundaries between self and other break down for you. Um, so that's a possibility with Neptune in the first. Okay, last planet, Pluto is a planet. That's that song I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, Pluto is a planet and it is, um, you know, the... Uh, slowest of the things we call planets in astrology and so it really has a generational signature um you know all those outer three do but we tend to talk a lot about pluto generations like astrologers will not refer to like boomers and millennials they'll be like you know pluto and scorpio and pluto and libra um so you can see the pluto themes they, like based on what sign a uh, generations Pluto is in, you'll see like the themes of that sign. So Pluto is a planet of transformation, of um, of death and rebirth, of intensity. It's very intense. Power comes up around Pluto. Um, depth. Um, Pluto is um, yeah. It has a very like strong like, soul link. Link. It's really important in evolutionary astrology, which we're not going to go into here, but. Um, th there is something connected there with the soul and the um, uh, the kind of like well, like I said, death, rebirth, transformation, and so there's a lot of um, like Pluto has the power to come in and really start a revolution, really overturn things. Really, P Pluto is like a pressure principle where it's like if the building's not strong, it's coming down. Now maybe the building is strong, but Pluto is a very intense energy. Um, and so it has the power to make shifts in things that feel really strong and stuck and stable. Um, and yeah, like I said, like trauma can come up in a personal chart sometimes, not always, but sometimes where you have Pluto, you know, there, there might be some, some sense of that, um, of trauma or just really like deep seated stuff, um, like, like really old stuff. Uh, that comes up for you. Um, it's, you know, sometimes Pluto, like wh whatever house it's in, you need to kind of have a death or have a transformational experience in that house to, to exist in that house. So like um, one of the astrologers I work with, amazing Tracy L. Rogers, highly recommend, um, great astrologer and life coach, uh, pointed out about my generation actually well and specifically it's there's a few years that like me that have Pluto and Scorpio Saturn and Scorpio and the south node in Scorpio um and if you have that little configuration it's pretty fucking heavy like it's intense right um and but one of the things for Pluto um in particular um, so Pluto and Scorpio generation, like we have a really, it's like a, Pluto's intense, Scorpio's intense, it's intense, intense. Uh, and I happen to have that in the fifth house. So for me, one of the ways that Tracy pointed out that that shows up is that in order for me to have, um, to create something fifth house, every creative process that I engage with, um, there's some like, challenge to it because of Saturn and also it has to go through a death it has to go through a process of like surrender and letting go um and um and there's some specifics I won't go into about my own chart there but um if you you know the house where you have Pluto in you may need to kind of have that so maybe if you have it in the seventh for example it's that like relationship can be really transformative for you they can also be really deep and affecting and traumatic and you kind of need to go through, um, be willing to like dig into that and, and have that transformational experience. Um, and so Pluto is currently, um, you may have heard of the US Pluto return. Right now, Pluto is where it was at the time of the founding of the United States. And so there's a lot of talk about is this like a big revolutionary transformative moment of the United States? Um, but 
like more generally, it's Pluto and Capricorn, and there, there's a lot of this like, especially as we come to the end of Capricorn, you know, we're noticing things like COVID, like real challenges to like structures and like Capricorn is things that last, you know, what will last, what will, Pluto's challenging that principle of things lasting and saying like, I don't know, will it? Like, you know, um, if it's not sturdy, then it might fall over. But if it is sturdy, then it gets tested and it survives. Um, that's just interesting to think about. Um, and so you can you can think about, like, I'm not going to talk about Pluto generations here, but you can kind of think about, like, who's in your Pluto cohort? What what sort of 20, I forgot, to, just like Pluto's orbit fell out of my head, but 20-something years, 28 um, year period, um, you know, how that kind of corresponds and links up to things like millennial or, you know, ter terms we use outside of astrology. Okay, so that's the planets. Um, Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you learned something. Just as a reminder, if you did find this valuable, um, check out the Patreon link below. If you want to support this kind of content, you can also just check out the newsletter. And I would love to have you join my list and find out when um, new stuff's going live, um, what's going on there. And uh, as a reminder, you can book a one-on-one -on -one reading with me below if you want to dig into your own chart and what, how the planets show up for you. Um, I practice intuitive embodied natal astrology um, and so we would really be, um, rather than focusing so much on prediction and timings, um, I tend to really look at how your natal chart shows up for you and what, um, what that looks like in your life and how you can work with those themes. So if that sounds interesting to you, um, then I would love to work with you and you can see the link below. Um, and otherwise, we'll see you for the next episode of Practical Astrology 101. Of course, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or things you'd like me to cover, you can leave a comment and I'll see you soon.